name's Shannon Haddock. Um, I work here at the Hoover Library as a fiction specialist, but my love is bringing the natural world to you guys. So um, as I said in the chat, we've done three of these. This is our third. There are two others. And um, if you want, if you didn't participate in those, um, go to YouTube or Facebook and Hoover Library has its own channel. You can find those videos, the recordings of the other bird watching session, plus a whole lot more we've been doing over the pandemic and has gotten recorded and put there. Um, this is our last bird watching uh, segment, but probably just until uh, the seasons change because I may have to strong arm Greg into doing another in the fall or something. So we'll get to enjoy yeah, that. To me. Yeah, and if you don't know Greg, uh, Greg Harbor has been with Alabama Audubon. He's been a member since the early mid eighties, but um, as he works at UAB as a researcher, but um, as his involvement grew, he was asked to do classes. He's done bird counts. He's done just about anything. Um, he's also a quite a great um, photographer. And so if you see his name on any of the upcoming Audubon classes, which I put in the chat, if you want to look up their courses, um, you know it'll be good if Greg's heading it up. So uh, no shade on any of the other guys, but you know, I'm, I've I'm got my favorite. So we will get started. Hopefully you have received from me a handout which Greg will be referring to time and again. Um, and that is the, I'm trying to find it now. What's that song handout? Um, Greg may explain a little bit where the origin story for it, but hopefully it'll give you a reference point to go to. And um, let's see, we've got 47 people and it's two after six. So Greg, if you want to start slow, we'll, we'll get started and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, that sounds good. So first off, I should ask if everybody can hear me okay. Somebody can give me a thumbs up. All right, good deal. So we're good to go with that. Um, and then uh, Shannon mentioned, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with this. So the What's, uh, what's That Bird song? Um, this handout was actually originally developed by my friend Harriet Wright, who is now deceased, but she was truly an encyclopedia of bird songs when it came to knowing anything and everything about birds. And so this list is actually one that Harriet developed, and she too had given a number of courses uh, and programs over the years. And so uh, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the birds, but it is a good list for the breeding birds uh, in our area. So I'm making the distinction of the breeding birds because generally when you are uh, hearing birds that are singing uh, this time of the year, um, th these are males for the most part, sometimes it's females, but for the most part, they are males that are singing on territory. So they're trying to establish a territory to attract a mate, a, a female, uh, while at the same time also telling other males in the area that you need to stay away because this is my territory. And so that's why we offer this class this time of the year is because, as you probably noticed uh, in the morning, if you are out and about, uh, the, the cacophony of bird song is truly everywhere. It's been that way for about a month now. Uh, and then as summer wears on, you start to hear fewer and fewer of the birds singing. And the reason that is, is because um, for the most part, nesting is now over. Um, and so the male no longer has a reason to be proclaiming to the world that, hey, everybody, I'm here, and thereby exposing himself to possible predation by giving away his territory and giving away his location. Uh, and certainly the same is true for the females. And so um, 
So this time of the year, May, June, July, a little bit into August, uh, are good times to be listening for the birds. But for the most part, it's this month and next month, May and June are certainly the peaks of bird songs. And so what I'm gonna do tonight, uh, just by way of introduction, is not to go over all of the birds that are listed in here, but what I have is a, a, a keynote program, uh, which is the PowerPoint. It's the Mac equivalent of a PowerPoint program. And I'm going to introduce you to uh, some of the bird songs of the more common birds that we have in our area. So we'll say the backyard birds, the ones that if you were to get up tomorrow morning and go for a walk in your neighborhood, uh, that you would probably hear, say, 15 to 20 different species of birds uh, just from walking around in your neighborhood. And then, so that'll be the first part of the program. And then for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about um, some of the birds that you may not have so much in your neighborhood, but which certainly could be found in our city parks, in our woodland areas, or along the creeks or the waterways, um, and so you're, I invite you to stay around for that as well. Uh, but I'm going to give you some tips on what to listen for and, and really kind of hopefully try to tune you in as to, as to what to listen for. It, you kind of have to, it's just like watching birds takes a little bit of practice. Listening to them takes a little bit of practice as well, and, and I'll illustrate that with just with two different stories, both of which happened uh, just Saturday, actually at Railroad Park. Not Saturday, Sunday at Railroad Park yesterday. So I was down at the park trying to get some pictures of birds, and I was reviewing the photos that I had already taken on my on my camera. When I heard a song, I thought, "Wait a minute, that's an orchard oriole singing." And so that's a bird that uh, does breed in our area, but it's not a really common breeder. And it's one I see so very few, a uh, few times at the park. So I immediately stopped what I was doing to go locate the orchard oriole that was singing. And it was just because I was tuned into all of the other birds that were singing. And I recognized those. It's almost like when you recognize somebody's voice and then all of a sudden somebody else pipes in, like, wait a minute, somebody else is speaking and that's a different sound for me. And then the other thing that happened was that it, it wasn't so much that it was a bird that I immediately recognized, so much it was a song that I knew was different. And I had to stop and tell myself, okay, what is it that I'm hearing? And I had to kind of break it down and play it through my head. All right, now what am I hearing? What are, and finally I came up with yellow warbler, which is about the same time that I saw the bird. And so, um, so that's just two examples of how this will hopefully come to you as you perfect your, your bird listening and your bird song identification uh, technique. So before we get too far along though, I would like to share my screen here and um, show you the Alabama Audubon website uh, that we have here. And so the first thing I would like to do to bring to your attention, so it's just Alabama, it's alaudubon.org. And I think Shannon may put this in the, uh, in the show notes if you wanna call it that. But the first thing I would encourage you to do is come over and check out under the support, uh, get the tag. If you are a person who has an interest in Alabama birds and in supporting Alabama Audubon's effort to protect those birds, I would encourage you to visit the website and um, investigate what's, what's listed here because Alabama Audubon is actually willing to pay the $50 uh, registration fee uh, that it would take for you to get this specialty license plate. 
Uh, and the good news is that technically you really don't even need to follow up with the purchase. All, Audubon, all, all Alabama Audubon needs now because of stipulations from the state is we just need the commitments. And we're trying to reach 1,000 commitments by October 31st. And as of now, we're just a little under 500 uh, people have registered. And so all the information is on the website. Uh, and I encourage you to check that out. And then the other thing that I would encourage you to ch uh, check on is the upcoming events. And this is something that Shannon had already mentioned um, in, the, in terms of the courses that Alabama Audubon is offering. Uh, unfortunately, our our good friend Paul Franklin is not going to be able to offer the breeding bird songs class, uh, which would have been a natural follow up to this very short introductory course uh, tonight. Uh, Paul is truly a gifted uh, teacher and just a, a whiz at identifying birds uh, by their songs and not only their songs, but even their call notes, just little chip notes. He recognizes those things. And, and uh, m much of what I learned about birds, I learned from Paul. And then we also have a course that's coming up later this month on uh, hummingbirds. And then starting in June, uh, there is a course that I'm going to be teaching uh, called it's Birding by Habitat. So that's something that's a little bit different in that you will learn about how to visit different types of habitat and know what to expect based on those habitats, uh, preferences for the birds. So I'll stop that share for the moment. And now I will go to my keynote program. And if you have any questions, feel free to type those into the chat box. And then I'll ask Shannon if she would please, if you see any questions or if there are questions that I need to address uh, as we're moving along, feel free to just chime in uh, before we get too far in. But uh, so I will go ahead and share this screen. And so learning bird songs. So I've got this here, birdie, 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 birdie. And for some of you, you may not, you may recognize already that I'm talking about Northern Cardinals when I put that there, but we'll get to the Cardinal in just a minute. So I have a couple of pointers to get started with up front. The first one is know the local birds. And so that's sort of what I was referencing when I mentioned being at Railroad Park yesterday morning and the mockingbirds were singing and the song sparrows were singing and the house finches were singing and the grackles were doing their little chacking noises. And then that's when I heard the orchard oriole and I thought I knew right away that it was something different and I needed to stop what I was doing and, and pay attention. Um, the other thing that uh, is helpful to know is to compare the unfamiliar song with the song that you know. And so that's pretty much what I just described. It was an unfamiliar song to me. It was one that I had to kind of drag up from my memory bank to refresh my memory. I have to do this every year. Uh, this time of the year to refresh my memory of like, oh, what is that that I'm hearing? And then we'll talk a little bit about this towards the end when I mention song families. Uh, so with that, we'll go right on in. So we're gonna talk about backyard birds first, as I mentioned. And the first one is the familiar Northern Cardinal. Uh, this is the male, of course, the bright red color with the crest and the black mask. And you've got a nice large finch eating type bill. And the one thing about cardinals that you really need to know, I, I debated whether I should start with this one because they have as many as 40 different songs that they do. And so it would seem kind of illogical to start with a bird that has so many different songs. But as you will hear in just a minute, um, all of the different songs that the bird uh, does that are in its repertoire, they sound similar. They're of a similar tone. 
and they have a similar quality. So if you recognize one song of the Cardinal, chances are you'll say, oh, wait a minute, that sounds a little bit like the here birdie 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 that, that Greg was talking about. So without further ado, I will play the Northern Cardinal song. Now I'm playing this on my computer. And um, if you would, make sure that you have your computer, uh, your volume turned up loud enough so that you can hear it. Now each of these segments plays for about 15, 20 seconds. And if we need to, we can go back and repeat it. Northern Cardinal. I'll stop that there. So as you heard, very much the same tone. And I, I have in there here, birdie, 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 birdie. So what I'm trying to imply there is that there tends to be a long slurred introductory note followed by a series of birdie, 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 birdie notes. And so this is a bird, the cardinal, that is among the earliest to get started in the morning. And it is certainly the one that I hear most often going to bed at night, so to speak, when it's truly getting almost completely dark outside, the Cardinal is still out there singing his little head off. And so this is one I would encourage you to get to know uh, just because they quite often are frequent visitors to our feeders and they will nest in our yards and shrubs and, and small trees. And so for that reason, this is a really good bird to get to know right off the bat. So we'll move on to our next bird. Northern Cardinal. And that is the Northern Mockingbird. And um, just as I mentioned that the Northern Cardinal is a challenge because it has so many different calls, um, the Mockingbird uh, may not be another good one to start with, but I started anyway because it is such a familiar bird to so many people and it is so widespread. And as the name implies, the mockingbird is capable of mocking the sounds of other birds that it hears. And it doesn't even have to be a bird. It could be a car alarm, just about anything. Um, and sometimes when I, when I hear them, I'll be thinking to myself, now, am I really hearing a mockingbird singing or am I hearing the bird that he's, you know, imitating? Am I hearing the original bird or am I hearing the mockingbird's imitation of that bird? And, and sometimes I will even say to myself, well, I haven't seen, say, for instance, the Phoebe but I know that the Phoebe has been there recently because the Mockingbird is doing the Phoebe's song. And we'll listen to a Phoebe in a little bit. But with the Mockingbird, um, it's essentially, it's a gray bird with dark wing and what we call white wing bars. So it's, I don't know if you can see on the screen here, these uh, little uh, white tips to the uh, secondary feathers, uh, but those are what we call wing bars. And this is, can be a fairly aggressive bird this time of the year. So for those of you that might have cats or dogs, if they are nesting in your yard uh, and you or your pets get a little bit too close, well, then the mockingbirds will certainly let you know that. Um, so I mentioned that the mockingbird is capable of imitating other birds. And he can do not just hundreds of sounds, but thousands of sounds. And so you're probably thinking, Greg, why are you, why are you torturing us like this? 
Well, the easy way to remember this is not that you need to know all of those thousands or hundreds of different songs that it sings, but just know that he repeats those uh, phrases three or more times. So he'll sing, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, put it there, put it there, put it there, move it, move it, move it, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. And he just will sit there and do this sometimes it seems like 24 hours a day when when the weather is good and it's a nice moonlit night if i can assure you that if you have a bird singing outside your bedroom window at midnight on a moonlit night it is a mockingbird okay so let's listen i'm going to go ahead and play this and let's listen for the fact that the phrases he's going to vary these phrases many many different times but listen for them to be repeated three or more times. And I, I, I emphasize the three or more because we'll have birds elsewhere in the program where they don't repeat the phrases. Northern Mockingbird. Uh, we'll move on from the mockingbird i will point out though as, as you were listening to those a couple of the songs that he was imitating for those of you that might have recognized him he was uh, imitating at one point a, a, a wood thrush and also i thought it was a bit ironic but he was also imitating the the mew sound of a gray catbird which in and of itself is a mimic but the gray catbird only does its phrases once and then periodically we'll interject. Uh, hey, that Greg, yes, uh huh. I will just say, I think everybody is in the same situation as I am. I hear the first one loud and clear, and then the other ones are, I can, if they're going on, I can't hear them. It's just silent after the first one. Hmm. So there's more than one source you're, you're playing. Um, I don't know that I do, but I can go back. Let me go back real quick and just try. Let me play it again. Northern Mockingbird. And how much of that could you hear? I could hear the, the second one, but very low, low. Very low. Hmm because I have got my sound turned all the way up. Okay. What I can do actually then is to, let me stop the screen share a minute. I just want it to be optimal for everyone. Oh, and I sure, hate to, absolutely. Oh, I hate to add complication to it, it. Yes, no, absolutely. So what I can do then is to go to this, um, let's see, I, I think what I want to do is come back to the screen share. And let's try this. So what I can do, and this is a, one of the things I was going to talk about. Um, let's see, so Carolina Wren was going to be my next bird. Okay. So let's listen and see if you can hear the computer sound. Can you Perfect. hear that one okay? Okay, so I will just, I will go back and forth. I will show you, I think I can alternate between Unfortunately, the, once it starts playing, I, it won't stop. <laughs> Let me go back. 
Okay, I'm going to get off, but I did. Uh, there are a couple of questions. And oh, sure. The mockingbird only mock birds that are near him at that time. I'm thinking no. I think he does. Doesn't the mockingbird mock whatever he hears, whenever? It, yeah, he can. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the time he's heard it. It can be something that he's dredged up from the past, or it can be an entirely new sound that he's just making up. It doesn't necessarily have to be something okay. that he just heard. That's everything for the chat. I'll, I'll okay. get off. All righty. So um, let me go ahead and um, go to. So I just wanted to hopefully all can uh, still see the picture of the Carolina Wren. So this is a tiny little bird, very active, very vocal, very loud. And generally the males and the females, when you hear one, they, um, they will often duet back and forth to one another. And so that's something that you can listen for is they do this very loud tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. Uh, sound, and then um, the female might respond to that. The male and the female look the same, but it's not uncommon to, to hear one and then the other one uh, responding back to that. So let me go back to uh, the website then, and we'll listen to them again. So again, this is our little friend, the Carolina Wren, very vocal, very loud bird. If you were to actually see this bird singing, you would probably think to yourself, oh my God, he's gonna hurt himself because they shake so much. They put so much effort into their singing uh, that they just truly are practically vibrating. Uh, they're, they're so energetic in their song. And so that's something that is a very common bird. They love being around human habitation. Uh, their favorite food item is spiders. So if you have Carolina wrens nesting near you, you can rest assured that they are doing their part to keep your spider populations under control. And the other little tidbit I'll mention about the Carolina wrens is that they love not only to nest near human habitation, but possibly even in human habitation. So if you have like a utility closet or a door that you might have left open, or um, like in my sister's case down in Florida, she was in the habit of on a summer day, uh, if it was not too terribly hot out, she might leave the garage door open a little bit just to get circulation through the house. And lo and behold, a Carolina wren came in and nested, built its nest, in her dryer vent in the span of a, of a few hours. And so it doesn't take much. Uh, it doesn't take long for them to do that. So let's go back to a uh, new share. We'll go back to our keynote and we'll see that our next bird is the Carolina chickadee. So this is the other Carolina. And so the Carolina chickadee is a small, tiny, tiny little bird. It's even smaller than the Carolina wren. And he is a bird or a she, both. Uh, they look identical, but these are birds that we call namesayers. Um, these are among the easiest songs to learn for the birds because as you will hear in just a moment, they're essentially saying their name. So when you listen for uh, chickadee, uh, listen, he'll say his, his, his name, chickadee, dee, 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 chickadee, dee, 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 dee. Uh, let me try one other thing. So one thing I do have is the ability to play the, the embedded sound file through the slide by clicking it 
So let me know, Shannon, if you would please, if you can hear this any better. Carolina Chickadee. I think maybe based on the expression on Shannon's face that she's having a hard time hearing. Yeah, the first one, I mean, I'm a bad judge because I wear hearing aids, but I'm looking yeah. at the audio options now. Yeah, the first, the first one comes out loud and clear. Okay, that's and then not so much. Yeah, no, I, I can, it's no trouble for me to go back to the All About Birds website and we'll try, uh, look for a different one. So we're going to go to the search feed, and this is actually a good exercise because um, it gives me the chance to demonstrate for you uh, how this wonderful website works. Um, so let's take just half a minute to look at the Carolina chickadee, and you can see that it has a photo of the bird, and the males and the females look similar. And so it will show you a range map of where they occur. It gives you some background information about the birds. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful resource. This is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, which is at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And it is just a great resource for birds. And so I can't recommend it highly enough. It is just a fantastic, uh, and it's free. It's completely free. So if you ever have any questions about it, feel free to contact me if you want, but just know that um, the All About Birds website at Cornell is very handy and it's just a great resource. So let's listen to its song a, a moment. And we're gonna be listening for the chickadee dee 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 dee, -dee and also the CBC Bay notes. Uh, and I think Harriet had mentioned that in her description uh, in their uh, handout as well. So let's take a minute and listen. So he was essentially doing the, um, the CBC Bay notes. So let me go over here. I'm, I'm trying to find the chickadee dee dee dee. It's trying to find some, as you can see, they have different listings for the different areas of the country. Try a few more. There we go.
So I'll just point out, so the first couple of listings are what they call the song, and then the calls are essentially vocalizations that are essentially not full-throated song, which I know sounds like a kind of a crazy distinction to make, but it does emphasize the point that birds um, have more than just songs that they sing. Sometimes it's call notes, sometimes it might be what they call chip notes, uh, and generally, it's just they're trying to convey to other birds certain information. Uh, sometimes it might be when birds migrate, uh, especially at night, they will utter what they call flight notes, flight chip notes. And the birds use those as a way of helping to maintain distance and uh, the continuity of the flock if they're flying together. It's not that they're flocking together is just that when the conditions are right for birds to migrate, uh, it helps them when they are aloft at night and they may not be able to see so well um, that if they're constantly chipping back and forth, it helps them to maintain the integrity of the group as they're flying. So let's go back to our keynote and we'll look at our next bird. And so that would be the tufted titmouse. And so my description for this one is Peter, Peter, Peter. This is a very loud, just like the Carolina wren is a very loud bird. The tufted titmouse is another very loud bird. And now all of these thus far have been birds that are common at your feeders. If you have a, a seed feeder out and tufted titmice are no different. So they're very common, uh, small little birds, about the same size as the Carolina uh, chickadee uh, and very loud. So we'll go back to our uh, All About Birds site here and we will look up our titmouse. So here's our, our little friend, uh, not very big. He's got a little crest on his head. So he's somewhat reminiscent of a cardinal. But as you can see, he is just this overall beige color, very light colored underneath and grayish up top. And you might see a little bit of black on him. But when you look at that bill, you should be thinking, oh, that's a seed eating type bill. And indeed they are seed eaters, but they will also come and eat suet as well if you have a suet feeder. But let's listen to them. So some people might say, I like to think that he's saying Peter, Peter, Peter. I've had people describe it as being Chiva, Chiva, Chiva. Whatever it is, just listen for that uh, two noted Peter, 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 or Chiva, Chiva, Chiva. This is a song, it's a very loud song. It carries well. Um, this past Saturday, we had an Audubon uh, field trip that went to Ebenezer Swamp uh, down in Montevallo, uh, just a little bit south of Hoover there. And the tufted titmice were everywhere and very vocal and singing. So let's listen for that again. And I will, I should mention that they also do some scolding notes as well. And uh, many times if you are out and about and you hear a lot of birds kind of scolding and getting very active at once, usually what that means is that some kind of a predator has come into the area. So if you hear a bunch of birds excitedly back and forth calling to one another, especially if the blue jays start chiming in, 
uh, you can rest assured that either a hawk has come into the area or there might be a snake or perhaps a cat, uh, but rest assured that something has happened to, to upset those birds. And so I always like to say when I'm looking for birds, um, especially in the winter time, the nice thing about the chickadees and the tit mice is that they are fairly vocal year round. And so if you learn to listen for those um, as you're walking through the woods or down a path or whatever, quite often the, the winter birds that are here uh, just you know for the duration of the winter, which are typically silent otherwise, um, a lot of times the birds will flock together because the chickadees and the titmice are the resident birds. They know where the food resources are. And so the other birds, the sparrows and perhaps um, maybe not so much cedar waxlings, but uh, birds, uh, purple finches, um, siskins, birds that are typically kind of moving through the woods will often hang out with the chickadees and the titmice because they know that the chickadees and the titmice know the local food resources and they're gonna take advantage of that. So let's move on to our next bird. And so that is going to be one that is um, quite the acrobat. The next two are the two species of nuthatches uh, that we have in Alabama as breeding birds. And so the first one is the white-breasted nuthatch. And as you can see in the photograph here, they do indeed have a white breast with a dark back and a dark uh, top on their head. But note that the bill on this bird is very chisel-like. It's almost like it's a woodpecker type bill. So based on that, <clears throat> you could almost surmise that these are birds that um, will eat peanuts perhaps, or they uh, might uh, chip away in, at the bark of a tree to get to an insect. And so you would be correct in making that assumption because that is exactly what they do. So let me go up here and we will revisit all about birds. And we're gonna listen to the nuthatch. Oops. It helps if you spell the name correctly. So as you, as you look at this, you'll see that there's a couple of different nut something. We've got a pygmy nuthatch, the red-breasted nuthatch, the brown-headed and the white-breasted. So we're gonna listen to the white-breasted. The brown-headed is the other nuthatch that breeds here. Red-breasted nuthatch is one that is only found here in wintertime. And the pygmy nuthatch is one that is a Western species. They've not ever been recorded in Alabama. But let's go to the white-breasted. And if you remember my note uh, from the keynote, the description for his sound was a loud yank, 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 yank. It sounds a little bit like somebody on a, you know, blowing a horn kind of thing. Yank, 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 yank. Very loud, very resonating, somewhat nasal in its um, tone. So I'll tell it to stop. So just a couple of reminders, the, uh, the beak very much like a woodpecker beak. Note that the claws, the, the, I don't wanna say they're talons, but the toenails on the woodpecker are just ideally suited for clambering on trees. And so this is the species that is comfortable going up a tree, down a tree, around a tree, all over the branches. I mean, as you can see in some of these illustrations here, uh, upside down on a tree trunk is not a problem for these birds. Uh, woodpeckers, on the other hand, tend to just face upward. 
Uh, now you might see uh, like, for instance, a red-bellied woodpecker or a downy perhaps uh, clinging onto a twig and maybe hanging upside down, but you'll never see a woodpecker going head first down a tree. But for the nuthatches, that is not a problem. They can go up a tree, down a tree, around the trunk, around the branches. For them, it's almost as if gravity means nothing, okay? So let's listen to the sound again and listen for that nasal yank, 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 yank quality to it. Okay, so let's go back to our keynote so that I can show you a picture of a brown-headed nuthatch. So these are birds that are even, the, the white-breasted is a fairly small bird. It's only about four inches long, maybe four and a half inches. And a brown-headed nuthatch is even smaller. Um, and I should mention that the brown-headed is fond of areas that have some pine tree, some element of there being pine trees, which is not to say that you have to live in a pine plantation to have these birds coming to your feeder, but it certainly helps if you do have pine trees in your neighborhood uh, for them, because this is uh, truly a bird that is fond of the pine trees. And the white-breasted on, on the other hand, its preferred habitat is more deciduous tree, more deciduous type wood. And so that's one way of kind of trying to help you distinguish between the two. As you can see in these photographs, these are birds just like the white-breasted. Being upside down is second nature to them. And so they just have the ability with their claws, their talons to just cling on and hang upside down and they've got the same little chisel shaped beak of, of a woodpecker. Uh, but note that they don't really hammer the trees like a woodpecker would, but they will certainly, if you put out peanuts or uh, black oil sunflower seeds, for instance, at your feeders, they will um, wedge that seed into a crack or a crevice or between their feet and they will kind of hack it open with their beak. So that's their modus, uh, method of operation, their modus operandi, so to speak. But let's go and listen to their uh, call. It sounds a little bit like a squeaky dog toy. So for those of you who have uh, dogs and uh, perhaps, Let's listen for this. So you're going to be in, imagining uh, your dog. You've just given your dog a new squeaky dog toy, and he is just having the time of his life squeaking that and chewing on it. So as I was listening to that, I had a flashback to my childhood of the little rubber ducky that all of the harbor kids, when we had to take our bath, our constant companion was the little rubber ducky that you could, you know, squeaky in the, uh, in the bathtub. And if he got too much water in him, well, then he would obviously stop squeaking. But uh, that is just absolutely the perfect description of, I think, the perfect description of a brown-headed nuthatch, uh, that squeaky dog toy. So just another quick listen.
Well, I should mention that with uh, a lot of these birds, um, it, even though I'm, I'm mentioning the habitat perhaps that they might prefer, sometimes it's not always easy to find them. And in this case, the brown-headed nuthatch is an example of that because they tend to be up in the uh, canopy of pine trees and they like to feed on, if they're not coming to your feeder, they will feed on the seeds in pine cones. And so, you know, some of our pine trees are these tall stately uh, trees that are just growing and, you know, they're, you can just hear them swaying in the breeze. And it's just a, a wonderful sound, I think, to hear the sound of the wind and the pines. Uh, but as far as being able to see the brown-headed nuthatches, sometimes it's, it's like my friend Harriet used to say, if you know what they sound like, you don't always have to know what they look like because you can look it up later, uh, what, they, what they actually, um, what they look like. But the brown-headed nuthatch is one that is fond of the treetops. And so not always the easiest thing to see uh, if it's not coming to your feeder. So let's go ahead and uh, check on a few more here. So this is one that is perhaps maybe the most abundant bird in Alabama, and that is the morning dove. And this is one that a lot of people, when they hear it, they think, oh, I've got an owl, because they hear this soft cooing noise. And so as you'll hear in, in just a moment, that is not the case. Uh, what you're hearing actually is the morning dove. And this is a bird that is very common. Uh, it's found in a variety of habitats, uh, urban areas, uh, suburban areas, in the woods, uh, fields, just they're found everywhere. And this is a bird that is actually capable of breeding any season of the year. So they've been documented nesting in, in every month of the year in Alabama. But let's listen to the morning dove. And it helps to remember that this is M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. So it's not morning is in good morning. It's morning is in, oh, that's a mournful sound. So listen to this soft coo, 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 and see if you don't think it truly is a mournful sound. As you can hear, it truly is a bit of a mournful sound. And this is a bird that starts singing early in the morning, even before it's you know, getting e even close to being daylight out. And so a lot of times people will hear that in the early morning and they'll think, oh, I have a, an owl of some sort, where in reality, it is the morning dove. And so the thing that's actually the owl that's closest to that in sound would be the great horned owl. So since I brought it up, let me go ahead and play the sound of the great horned owl, just so that you see what I mean, the distinction between the two. So the great horned owl is the largest owl that we have in Alabama. It's not particularly common, but they do occur here in, in decent numbers. It's just because of their secret, secretive habits, we don't often encounter them so much. Um, they do tend to nest in large trees. Uh, they are at the top of the food chain when it comes to predatory birds. Uh, the joke among the, the birding community is that, you know, what does a great horned owl eat? And the answer is anything it darn well pleases. Um, if they can 
grab it, uh, rabbits, skunks, actually skunks are their favorite prey item. So if they can catch it and subdue it, well, they will eat it. So just listen for that again. And the way I'd like to remember it is, who's awake, me too. Who's awake, me too. Did you hear that? Who's awake? Me too. So quite often they do have some fairly long pauses between their phrases. So that's something you just have to learn to, to recognize. So let's look at the next one, also a very common uh, bird uh, in our yards, especially. Um, they'd like to be in areas that have a good shrubbery uh, areas where they can maybe come out onto your grassy areas. Uh, but they like to be able to retreat into shrubs. So if you have a lawn or a yard that is nothing but um, open landscape and not much in the way of cover, then chances are you will not have uh, the eastern tohu, uh, just because they do like to scratch on the ground, um, but they're not fond of areas where they can't immediately escape into cover. And that's true of a lot of our yard birds, our backyard birds, is that they really do need cover. Uh, and so if you are providing a bird feeding station, you, it behooves you to also provide cover for them. It doesn't always have to be shrubbery. If you have a brush pile and you can put that near the feeders, well, that will work. And the reason I say that is because there are other species of birds, hawks in particular, certain hawks, that will prey on other birds. And so if you have a feeding station out, not only do the little Tweety birds know that your feeding station is there, but the Cooper's hawk and the sharp shin hawk, they know that your bird feeding station is there as well. And they will start hunting the birds that are coming to your feeder. So in order to make it somewhat of a level playing field, you need to provide the cover for the birds. So let's listen to the tohi, and with him, you'll want to listen to the drink your tea, drink your tea. Now, whether it's sweet tea or unsweetened tea, I don't know. That'll have to be your preference. But just listen to the drink your tea, and do know that sometimes what he does is he'll sing drink, and sometimes he just does the tea. And sometimes it might be drink your. So it's if he does the full song, it's this wonderful drink your tea. But if he doesn't do the full song, it might just be an abbreviated version of that. So let's listen to the tohi. So I should mention before we get into that, here is the adult male. So he's got the black and the rufous and the white. And on the female in the immature birds, where the male is black, the female is brown. So other than that, they look uh, very similar. Uh, also note that these birds have got red eyes. Um, it's not uncommon, I should say it is uncommon, that you might uh, occasionally see one that has a white eye. But for the most part, these are birds that are uh, black, rufous, and white with this dark blood red eye. I, I like to think of them as being in, uh, Indian corn. That's what it reminds me of, is the three different colors, especially the females of Indian corn, the candy. But let's listen to the drink your tea.
we'll pause it just half a minute and we'll use this opportunity to remind you that whenever you see a beak that is this shape, that's a very cone-shaped beak that is an ideal beak for cracking open seeds. And so for that reason, you would probably surmise that this is a bird that spends a lot of time uh, on the ground as it happens uh, searching for seeds. So if you want to feed them uh, to come to your yard, you could put out a like a hanging feeder but you would also want to include uh, like a platform feeder or you could just scatter seed on the ground. But if you decide to scatter the seed, I wouldn't scatter a whole bunch just because you don't want the seed to mold or go rotten if it doesn't get consumed uh, that day. Uh, and again, be sure to spread it near the cover uh, the ground cover so that the bird can escape. But let's listen to that drink your tea one more time. So it really is a very sweet note uh, song that they sing. And it's, uh, yesterday at Railroad Park, they were singing a lot and it's a very musical, uh, that one sounds a little bit hoarse, uh, but it's just a beautiful, beautiful song. So let's visit some of our woodpeckers. These are also common birds that come to our feeders uh, and it might be platform feeders or it could even be the tube feeders, the hanging feeders. Uh, black oil sunflower seed, uh, for those of you that may have been in on the first courses, may remember that black oil is a really popular overall food uh, source for birds and one that I recommend the most just because it has the highest fat content of all the different seed types. But I have this particular photograph in here uh, because it, even though it's called a red-bellied woodpecker, the red in the belly is not all that noticeable. And so when you see this bird, you might be thinking, oh, it's a red-headed woodpecker. But a red-headed woodpecker is actually an entirely different species of birds. All of our woodpeckers have some red on them somewhere uh, in the head. It's just, it's the distribution that uh, varies uh, somewhat. But certainly in the case of the red-bellied woodpecker, the red is indeed not only on the head, but it's also on the belly. It's just that the belly is not the most obvious. But let's listen to this. Um, this is a bird that is one that you really wanna to get to know um, just because it is a very common, common woodpecker. So let's go, we're gonna to have to well, what do you know? They don't have, I can't believe it. They don't have red-bellied woodpecker. Let me try typing in red-bellied. Well, I'll be darned. They don't have red-bellied woodpecker listed. Well, I'll tell you what, let me go back and we'll just see if we can listen to just a little bit from my keynote. Hi, Greg, they did have it there. Oh, did you see it? I didn't notice it. Okay, let me go back and... Yeah, it was there. I, okay. Oh, there it is, red-bellied woodpecker. A very loud chur, chur, chur. Let's listen again. So, a couple of things I'll point out because they have these photos here with our woodpeckers. Um, 
note that they have two toes forward and two toes backwards as a means of helping them navigate on trees. And also with the woodpeckers, uh, they have uh, tails that are specifically adapted to them when they are perched on a tree, like these are here, their tails are pointed in such a way that it kind of acts like a kickstand to help them prop on the trees. And so that's an adaptation that you will see on all of our woodpeckers. Um, I should note that the male is the one that has the red starting at the base of the beak and going all the way around to the nape of the neck. So this whole distance. The female, on the other hand, only has the coloration on the nape. The crown of the head is not red. Okay, so that's one way that you can tell them apart male from female. But let's listen to that chur note again. Okay, so since we're here, let me go and we'll look up the downy woodpecker. So the downy is, the, the red-bellied is probably the most common of the woodpeckers that would come to your feeder. The downy is much smaller than the red-bellied, um, very delicate little bird, and it has just a tiny, tiny little beak. Um, and this is a case where uh, when you hear it, you almost get, you can almost hear how small it is. So they tend to do a little pick note followed by a, a little, what sounds like a horse whinny. So they didn't have the whinny in there. Let's go up to the sound here. And let's see if they will, oh, they have the calls. So it's just playing the pick note. Let me let me find the Winnie call for you. So it's this. It, to me, it sounds just like a little miniature descending whinny. So if you can imagine a horse whinny, except on a much smaller, much tinnier scale, then that is the song and the call of the downy woodpecker. If we go back to the keynote screen, I've got a picture here of a downy woodpecker in my neighborhood. So one thing, the very similar looking uh, woodpecker to this is the hairy woodpecker, but the hairy is not nearly as common in Alabama. It is a bird that is fond of deciduous woods, large stands of deciduous woods, um, and they're not particularly common at coming to your feeders. But one way that you can tell them apart, they look identical, except that there is a size difference. And the other difference on a downy woodpecker, you will see black spots on white outer tail feathers like you can see in this bird here. And then the other distinction, the, the hairy woodpecker therefore lacks, it does not have those black spots. And the, the bill, the length of the bill is another indication. So in the case of a downy woodpecker, if it's the distance from the base of the, from the tip of the bill to the base of the bill 
is less than the distance from the base of the bill to the back of the head, you've got a downy woodpecker. And the way that I like to remember it is to say that the downy has a dinky bill. A hairy woodpecker, on the other hand, has a much longer bill that is the equivalent of from the base of the bill to the back of the head. So it's a much longer bill. So for those of you that may have been in my earlier class, we were talking about size being a relative thing when you're looking at it. But this is the case where you can use the bird as its own scale. So is the bill the same length from the tip of the bill to the base of the bill as from the base of the bill to the back of the head? If it is, then you've got the hairy. The hairy has a honker. Downy has a dinky bill, the hairy has a honker. All right, kind of corny, but it will help you to remember that. Greg, that's way too corny, I love it. <laughs> Sorry, but that's just the way I am. So now I'm gonna show you a few of the uh, other common birds that you would have, but maybe not coming to a feeder, all right? So this is the Eastern Phoebe, and he is one of those namesayers. So thank goodness for him. So as you might imagine, if he is a namesayer, his song, if you want to call it that, is going to be Phoebe. And lo and behold, So they will sit there and do that continuously a lot. And uh, the other thing I should mention is that these are birds. We live in an area where this is a year round species for us. So if you look at this range map down here, we are in the purple, which means that it is a year round permanent resident. So this is one that you could have at your house, in your yard, year round and these are birds that are quite fond of human habitation so much so that you know they will get accustomed to you they will come and land on you or they will fly right up to you if you have like an eve on your porch or a column on your porch that has a little lip on it they will come and you know nest on the porch if, if it's not a carolina wren it's going to be a an eastern phoebe but these are just the cutest most accommodating little bird and again he is a namesayer so to me they have a little bit of a helmeted look uh, because they're kind of grayish brown and then they have a little bit darker coloration on the head but regardless it's going to be that very raspy phoebe phoebe So all I can say is thank God for the namesayers because it makes it a whole lot easier. So I mentioned earlier about the, when I was talking about the Northern Mockingbird repeating his phrases three or more times, here is the gray catbird appropriately named because it is gray, he's got a black cap. And um, when they're doing their notes, they do have a note, a mu note, that sounds almost like a cat mu. So let me type in catbird here. There's only one species of catbird. And remember, so the phrases, it's only going to sing those phrases once before it goes on and does another phrase. And then periodically, they interject that that meow, that very raspy meow note. So let's listen to this.
So it's doing a variety of different phrases there, none of which were repeated. Now, let me go to the sounds page because I really would like for you to hear the mu the calls. So clearly it sounds very much like a cat. Um, gray cat birds are birds that like dense shrubbery. And so if your yard, again, if it's much more open and doesn't really have any shrubbery or dense areas of vegetation, you probably will not have one of those uh, as, a, as a regular yard bird. But if you, if you do, it, it doesn't necessarily take a whole lot. It's just I have a friend that lives up in Clay uh, who's got what I would say is, you know, a typical front yard with shrubs in front of the house and she's got trees around. Um, but she's got gray catbirds nesting in the shrubs right in front of her house. So it doesn't take much, but that is something that they do need. And again, you were listening for the, um, for that, the phrase is not being repeated and just going on and on and on. And then that those new notes. So again, just going on and on and on and not repeating those phrases at all. So let's listen to this next bird. And this is the brown thrasher. So it too has a, uh, it's one of the mimic thrushes. So the three mimic thrushes that we have in Alabama indeed are the gray catbird, the brown thrasher, and the northern mockingbird. So um, they call them mimic thrushes because they mimic the sounds of other birds. They also call them thrushes, and it's not so much that um, they are thrushes. All of our thrushes that we do have in Alabama have spots on them. If you look at the brown thrasher, you might say, yeah, he's got spots, even as the adult. But if you go back and look at the gray catbird, no spots. If you go back and you look at the mockingbird, again, no spots. But as young birds, they do have spots, the babies do, okay? So that's where the thrush part of mimic thrushes comes in. But with the brown thrasher, it has the same type of habitat preference as the gray catbird. So it's going to need um, shrubs, uh, open areas. They like to um, spend their time on the ground and they use this really long beak to just thrash at the leaf litter. Um, it truly is quite a sight, somewhat comical to watch these birds when they're feeding because they just use that bill just back and forth, back and forth, uh, trying, it's like they're trying to sweep the, the ground with their bill and not having much luck because it's just a long, it's not a big bill, it's just a long narrow bill. But when you listen for it, uh, when you're listening, listen for the phrases that are repeated twice. Pick it up, pick it up, put it down, put it down, put it there, put it there, pick it up, pick it up. But hopefully you can hear that, the, the paired note quality uh, to their song. But that's one way without even seeing the birds. And that's true of all of these. You can identify them just based on what they sound like. And they do share the gray cat bird and the brown thrasher share that same habitat preference. Mockingbirds are a little more ubiquitous. They're not quite the 
uh, habitat specialists like these birds are. The mockingbirds are a little more um, widespread because they're so adaptable. Uh, so let's listen to some of the finches. So the house finch is a relative newcomer. I say relative newcomer to Alabama. They've been here for about 20 years now and they're becoming much more widespread than they ever were. Uh, my friend Helen Kittinger, I can remember her telling the story of going to uh, Huntsville. Uh, the very first time one was ever reported in the state, there was one coming to a feeder in Huntsville, Alabama, and everybody that was anybody in the birding community made the drive to Huntsville to go look at the house finch that was there because it was such a rare bird. Now they're found everywhere in the state. So this is a case of they were not so much introduced into Alabama, they were actually a Western species that was introduced into the New York City area and then they spread from there. And so um, it is the bird that has, used to be on the West Coast introduced to the East Coast and then they kind of migrated towards the middle and now they're found uh, nationwide. So let's listen to this. Now this, the house finch is truly a busy, complicated song, but what you wanna listen for are these upslurred two notes, okay? So hopefully they'll, they'll play that. So can, can you hear that? Let me stop that again. So if you're listening, you're going to hear this bright, lively chatter, and all of a sudden you hear the reet, more chatter, bright, lively chatter, and then reet. And every once in a while, it just stops and throws in this reet. And then it, towards the end of this segment, it does have a little bit more of an upslurred uh, tone to it. But let's listen for it again. And what you're listening for is this bright, lively sounding chatter with this uh, re note that's interspersed in there. It's very raspy uh, and it, it carries well. And when you hear it, you just think, oh, what a beautiful sound. And all of a sudden it's like it hit a skid mark uh, before it resumed. Hey, yeah. This, this one we're not able to hear. We heard the first one and then it just kind of died out. Not okay. sure. Let me try it again. So oh, if, if you had trouble hearing that, if you would make a note to yourself to visit the All About Birds website, it's just A-L-L-A-B-O-U-T-B-I-R-D-S dot org. So it's all about birds, one word, dot org. And you can go back and listen. Uh, I don't know, I don't know why it's not uh, coming through because uh, I do have it set for uh, sharing. Well, let me try. Let me click one thing here real quick and see. Let me try this. House Finch. It's working now. Okay. So did you hear that? There's chick chick re 
A very lively sound, but just listen for that the, the upslur two notes and then that re it's just it gets it's almost like it's going along and then it hits a rough patch and it kind of skids before it kind of corrects itself and then continues on with that bright lively notes. Um, I should mention that this is the male. If this were the female, uh, she would be just the same overall brown color. She doesn't have any red on her at all. Um, the one bird that you might confuse this with is the purple finch, uh, which we do not have here as a breeding species. Now, it just so happens that this past winter has been a good winter, uh, what they call an eruption year for purple finches. But by now, almost all of them have moved back north to breed. Uh, so if you see them now, this time of the year, without a doubt, it's going to be the house finch. So let me move on to the goldfinch. And then this is one uh, that also has a bright, lively, finch-like song. So when I mentioned earlier about this family, the song family, so the finches all have this bright, uh, resonant uh, sound to it, just very lively song, just kind of very bubbly. But then on the, on the uh, goldfinch, Listen, if you look down here, I've got this description of potato chip. So at the beginning of this clip, you'll hear the potato chip notes of the American goldfinch. And then they too have this kind of this interruption of this that goes right on through it. But listen for the potato chip right at the very beginning. And this is a bird that will also sing when it's flying. They have a very bounding flight, just very up and down, up and down. And you'll hear this potato chip, potato chip. American Goldfinch. Potato chip. can back this up, but it, it, the house finch had that loud ree, but on the gold finch, it's much more of a smooth note, but the potato chip is just scattered throughout. And then it's so lively, it just kind of almost makes your head hurt. It's like, can you please just enunciate your notes a little more clearly so that I can hear them? But instead, it's just this very lively chatter. So I'm going to play it again because at the very beginning is where you hear the potato chip notes a lot at, at, at the beginning of the clip. So listen for the potato chip. I don't know if it's lays, baked, kettle cooked. I don't know. You have to decide that for yourself. But listen for the potato chip. American Goldfinch. That's that chattery stuff that just makes your head hurt. You just, you know, will you please settle down? And then you heard that ring, it goes right on through. It's a nice uh, upslurred, uh, kind of a almost like somebody 
you can imagine a, a zipper, a smooth, uh, smooth sounding zipper. So let's go to, I wanna pick out a few more. I'm keeping an eye on the time here. I wanna pick out some of the other birds that are more common that you probably already know, but it would be worthwhile just to refresh your memory. The blue jay has the very loud J notes. Blue jay. very loud, raucous calls, J, J, J. And usually when you see one, you see four or five of them. They're, they're highly intelligent birds and they tend to travel together. Um, I should mention, I'll come back to the American crow. It's another easy one, but let me go to the red-shouldered hawk. And I wanna play this one because blue jays are really, really good mimics of red-shouldered hawk. So red shoulders are birds that like deciduous woods near water. So if you are ever out at the Cahaba River there through uh, Hoover somewhere, or it might be even at uh, a Moss Rock Preserve, for instance, where you've got a little creekside riparian zone area, a streamside area, this is a bird that you almost certainly will have there even if you don't see it but they have a very uh, nasal sounding call and the blue jays are quite good at imitating it. So much so that I sometimes have to stop and think to myself, well, now is that the red shouldered or is that a blue jay imitating a red shouldered? And sometimes I just, I can't make the distinction. I think that the red shouldered is a little bit more nasal sound to it and the blue jays are not quite as good at it. Red-shouldered hawk. And so they will carry on like that. They're very vocal birds and you'll hear them either when they're perched in trees or they might be up flying. Uh, but the red-shouldered is a fairly common hawk in our area and probably the most common would be uh, in your neighborhood would be a red-tailed hawk. And so this is an immature bird that I actually photographed at Railroad Park, uh, just a block away from Railroad Park. And although it's called the red-tailed um, in this bird, which is an immature, the tail is actually banded. Otherwise, the adult looks almost identical, except that the upper surface of the tail is this brick red color. But listen for the keer. Uh, it's a very loud, it, it almost, well, I'll tell you what, I'll play it and, then, and I'll tell you a little cue to remember it by. Red-tailed hawk. So more of a shriek than anything, but it's just this loud keer, keer, keer. And it, it, I'm gonna play it again, but what I want you to think of as you're listening to it this next time is think of every Western you have ever seen, every poorly made B-rated <laughs> Western you've ever seen when the man, the cowboy is on his last leg, he's dying, he's out of water and the vultures are circling or the eagles are coming in and, you know, vultures don't, they don't really have much of a vocal cord so they don't say anything. Vultures are pretty much silent, but invariably they will play the sound of 
a red-tailed hawk that gets dubbed in because it just doesn't sound good to say, oh, the vultures are circling and then silence. So they dub in the sound of a red-tailed hawk. The other time that you will hear the sound of a dubbed in uh, red-tailed hawk was about 20 years ago. Almost any commercial that Buick made where they showed one of their cars driving across the landscape. In the background, you could hear the song or the call of a red-tailed hawk. So you should either be thinking really bad Westerns or a Buick car commercial. All right, so here we go. So not much to it, but that is the red-tailed hawk. And it's by far the most common hawk in Alabama. So just be aware of that. So I mentioned the crow, he's another easy one just because he goes caw, caw, caw. American crow. So this is the bird, they're very common, very smart. They travel together in family groups. Um, they are highly intelligent. They're, the corvids in general, the, cray, the crows, the ravens, and the blue jays are all part of the corvid family. That's C-O-R-V-I-D, not COVID, but corvid. And so as a group, they are highly intelligent birds and very vocal and they travel together in flocks and you'll see them flying overhead. Uh, but that's an easy one to recognize as well as uh, by sight and by sound. So now I mentioned earlier about, uh, so these are most of the, what I call the backyard birds, the birds that are more common. So now what I would like to do is to segue from that into some of the birds that you will probably hear if you are out on a visit to, uh, let's say, Moss Rock Preserve or some of the parks that might be in your neighborhood. And so if you've got a mix of trees or shrubs or open scrubby areas, these next birds are ones that you will likely hear, but you may not see. But to introduce them, I am going to start with a bird that you most definitely have seen in your yards everywhere, and that is the American robin, okay? So this is a bird, a lot of people say, oh, the robins are back, spring is right around the corner. Well, in reality, spring robins never left. In Alabama, they are, let me rephrase that, in our area, in the Birmingham area, they are a year round species for us. They breed here, they nest here, they occur here in the winter time. Down at the coast, um, they're very uncommon as a breeding bird, um, but otherwise elsewhere in the state, starting about Montgomery, moving north from there, they start to become a little more common. But this is a bird that you really want to get to know their song because there are other birds that sound similar to them. So let's listen to the bright, cheery uh, phrases of the American Robin. American Robin. So cheer up, cheery, chirl up, cheerly. And they just go on and on and on. So let's listen a little bit more. And that's kind of like what I call their little whinny notes. They also do some bup, bup, bup notes.
So those were the bup, bup, bup notes. So now, so remember that very bright, cheery phrases just kind of runs on. So let's listen to a bird that doesn't look anything like an American robin, but does sound very much like an American robin. And the phrases are, it's robin-like phrases, but it's a little on the raspy side and it's choppier. So let's listen. So the summer tanager, by the way, is one that prefers woodland areas, uh, deciduous trees. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a riparian area, just any deciduous tree uh, will do, but they tend to like more intact forested areas. It's not one that if you said, oh, I've got a tree, uh, uh, a white oak, you know, in, growing in my backyard, so where's my summer tanager? This is a bird that really does to like have more, uh, a much more extensive tree canopy. But let's listen to the summer tanager. Robin-like phrases, choppier. So they're long phrases with short pauses between them. Summer tanager. So hopefully you were able to pick up on those somewhat like a robin, except choppier phrases, fairly long phrases with short pauses. And then at the very end of those clips, you heard what they call the petite tuck. So if you look at that handout that Shannon sent, uh, Harriet's description had that in there. It's the petite tuck. And so that's something that if you're wondering, am I hearing the robin or the summer tanager? With the robin, you'll hear those bup, bup, bup notes. Uh, very much uh, the bright, cheery phrases of the robin, but it's going to have the bup, bup, bup. The summer tanager, on the other hand, does those petite tuck. And so as you're sitting there listening to the phrases, and you're going, hmm, give me a hint, give me a hint, and all of a sudden the summer tanager goes petite tuck. Well, then he just told you, I'm the summer tanager. Okay, so when you're listening to him, it can be kind of confusing in that regard if you're just listening for the phrases. So the key is to make sure that you um, listen long enough to hear the petite tuck or the bup, bup, bup. So I wanna go back to the All About Birds because I want to uh, visit our friend, the Scarlet Tanager. So the scarlet tanager is just absolutely a drop dead gorgeous bird. And in our area, they are found generally in the upper elevation. So if you live in Hoover, uh, if you live on the slopes of the Red Mountain or uh, Shade Mountain, you might be fortunate enough to have one of these as a breeding bird. Uh, near you. Um, certainly in Oak Mountain State Park, if you go up to the top <clears throat> of the ridge where Peavine Falls is located, you can hear them up there. So it really is the upper, it, we're right at the dividing line where these occur as a breeding bird. Further north from here, they're not so much confined to the upper elevations where they're found, but in our area, that's generally the case. But as we listen to the scarlet tanager, you're gonna hear those same robin-like phrases, but note that the phrases are shorter and the pauses are longer. So short phrase, long pauses, and then when it finally does give you his little gimme, his little uh, gimme a hint notes, what it's gonna say is chick burr. Chick burr. So let's listen for this.
So hopefully you're picking up on these short phrases, long pauses between them. The scarlet tanager, excuse me, the summer tanager was just the opposite, long phrases with short pauses. So I think I may have to go over here to the sounds tab to get to the calls. The, so the, the chick burr notes are what we would call um, the calls. So here in the description, they make the distinctive chick burr. So let's listen. Chick burr, chick burr. Okay, so just to recap, we had the American Robin with this bright, cheery, chirlup, chirly, chirlup, chirly. It goes on and on and on. And it just, um, it doesn't really, when it pauses, it might be a very short pause, but they just overall very long strings of phrases, very bright, cheery, up, down, kind of all over the place. And when it does give its call notes, it's just this uh, bup, bup, bup kind of notes. The summer tanager, somewhat like a horse robin, uh, has long phrases with short pauses, and he does the little patitty tuck. And then on the scarlet tanager, it is the short phrases with long pauses. So those are the things you want to listen for. So when they talk, talk about the robin song family, that's what they're talking about. In the last bird that is in our area that has, that is part of that family is one that is passing through right now as we speak. They're here for about three weeks in the spring when they're singing. And this is the adult, uh, the, excuse me, the male rose-breasted grosbeak, just a drop dead, gorgeous, take your breath away bird. If you've got a feeder out with black oil sunflower seed, hopefully one will pay you a visit uh, in these next couple of weeks that they're here. But they showed up about a week and a half ago and they'll probably be here for another week or so, maybe a week and a half. They breed not too far north of Alabama. So it's unfortunate that, that they don't breed here, but they don't, uh, unfortunately. But with the case of the uh, rose-breasted grosbeak, very much the robin-like phrases, but this is a robin that has taken voice lessons from, you know, the teacher at the Met. So let's listen to a robin uh, that sings opera. So there is what I, what I say is the Robin uh, that took voice lesson. So while we're on the theme of birds with musical songs, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the wood thrush. Unfortunately, this is a bird that many of you probably do not have in your yards unless you happen to live next to a wooded area. Uh, this is a bird that, and it doesn't take that much wood, maybe just a half acre, an acre, some, something like that. They generally need a little bit larger. But I had a friend that lived in a little townhouse in Cahaba Heights, and she had just the smallest little patch of wood behind her house, and she had a wood thrush. And this is what she got to listen to every morning. So very much flute-like. And I didn't mention this at the beginning, but the wood thrush is a really good uh, bird, a good example of a bird to talk about this. The reason they're able to make such uh, varied songs and 
uh, uh, vocalizations for the most part for the songbirds at least is that their their voice box uh, we have a larynx which is essentially just one voice box but with the with the birds the songbirds they have a syrinx which is actually two voice boxes and so they can actually manipulate either one of them uh, separately from one another. And uh, a friend of mine, actually Paul Franklin, I think was the one who described it, that the Viri is a bird that sings in harmony with itself. So that's gonna be your homework assignment for tonight once we're done here, is to go to the All About Birds website and just Viri, it's V-E-E-R-Y, and listen to that. It is just the most ethereal uh, sound. But let me go back. I do have just a few more that I want to show you uh, or introduce you to uh, from here. And so this one is the red-eyed vireo. Now this is truly a bird that you could probably go all summer long without laying your eyes on any of them, but hearing them everywhere if you are in the woods. And so this is the most common bird of the Eastern deciduous forest. And so it, it illustrates very well, it's a very plain looking bird. They tend to be slow moving and they spend almost all of their time up in the canopy and they are counter shaded. So they're light colored underneath and they are green up top. And so if you are below the bird looking up, you see white against white. And if you see, if you were somehow looking on the bird from above, you see green against green. So it blends in very well in the fact that they hardly move when they're singing just makes them so difficult to actually see one. However, yeah. yes. Does it actually have a red eye? It does. And so you bring up okay. a very good point. So this one is a bird that I photographed last uh, fall, I think it was in September, uh, and the immature birds have dark eyes, but the adult birds have red eyes. If you remember the red eye of the um, tohi, that bright, bright brick red with the, um, with the red eyed vireo, it's the same color, okay? It's just that the juvenile birds, and this is true of a lot of birds, the juvenile have a different eye color than the adults do. So you're very good at making that observation. But this is a bird that when you hear it, it just goes on and on and on and on. Look at me way up high in the tree. Look at me way up high in the tree. Look at me way up high in the tree. And I think I remember reading, it may have been on the All About Birds website, but it mentions that these birds sing as many as 40,000 phrases in a day. So what that tells me is that some poor grad student, when he was doing his research, had to record how many times a red-eyed vireo sang in an hour. And then he came back an hour later and recorded, are they still singing at the same rate? And then an hour later. And so, listen to this, it's rather monotonous, slightly musical, but it just goes on and on and on and on. Even when all the other birds have stopped singing mid-morning, a lot of our birds sing early in the morning and then about 10, 30, 11 o'clock when it starts to get warm, they have the sense to kind of cool it for a little bit. Not the red-eyed vireo. Red-eyed vireo. So just on and on and on. And they will do that all day long. They don't know when to stop. So let me go on to two birds that I for sure would like to introduce to you just because they're such spectacular birds. Um, in the indigo bunting, um, this is a bird that likes open brushy areas, um, fence rows, uh, pasture areas where along the edge of woods. So at the, at the 
fairly general bird, but it does generally like to have some open habitat, whether it's like a brushy field and a good place to actually to go that I'm thinking of would be like Moss Rock Preserve where the prairie area is, not where the uh, creek goes through the canyon, but in the northeastern part of Moss Rock would be a good place to look for the indigo bunting. And this is one that when you're listening to this bright cheery song, just like the, the finches, but listen for the paired note quality. And then we're gonna compare that in just a second to another bird that looks almost, doesn't look, it's similar looking, but doesn't sound the same. Indigo bunting. Hopefully you can hear that, this like sweet, sweet, choo-choo, sweet, sweet, choo-choo-choo. So paired notes. So listen for, compare that to the blue growth beak, which is not as common, but has a similar habitat preference. It's, it's a bigger bird. It too is all blue, like the indigo bunting is. So here's our indigo, all blue, the male. On the blue growth beak, it's also blue, but it has these chestnut wing bars. But when you hear the song, listen for the quality of the indigo bunting, but it's a huskier, deeper voice, and the notes are not paired. Blue growth beak. Hopefully you can pick up on that. Let me go back to the indigo bunting. Indigo bunting. So hopefully you're able to pick up on the paired note quality. Very bright, cheery. So that's the indigo bunting, and then the blue growth beak. Blue growth beak. Okay, and then I want to wrap up just with two more birds and then we'll call it a night, but I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. So I mentioned earlier that we had an Audubon field trip that went down to Ebenezer Swamp and probably the signature bird that everybody wants to see when they go to uh, Ebenezer is the prothonotary warbler. And if this is a bird that you have not ever seen you owe it to yourself to go to Ebenezer Swamp. There's a lovely boardwalk that goes through the swamp. It's probably about maybe 200 yards long, 150 yards, something like that. And the prothonotary warbler, which used to be called the golden swamp warbler, uh, breeds there. And they are just a spectacular sight to see. And uh, you'll want to listen for their song. Sometimes they're up in the canopy, but if they come down, which they will quite often do, this is a bird that nests in tree cavities. And so it's not uncommon for them to come right down to eye level, uh, maybe even right on, they'll stand on the, on the edge of the boardwalk. But listen for the sweet, 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 sweet note of the prothonotary warbler. Prothonotary warbler. So 
So I'll pause it there just for half a second, just to, re, um, to tell you something that Paul Franklin reminded us of on the field trip. And that is that a lot of birds, when they sing, as this uh, male is doing here, they cock their heads back and they project their voice upward. And so, as Paul reminded us, a lot of times when you're looking for the bird, you might be looking too high because they're projecting their voice upward and then it's bouncing off the leaves and coming back down to your ears from a higher elevation than the bird really is. So I encourage you to go there. It's on County Road 24. It's, it's the Shelby County Airport Road exit. Uh, and you can just Google it. It's called Ebenezer Swamp Ecological Reserve. It's, part, it's in Montebello and it's a field station for the University of Montebello. And then the other bird that I wanna mention that also occurs there is the Northern Parala. And this is one that kind of tests the limits of your hearing in that it's this nice ascending buzzy trill and then it has a little hiccup at the end. Northern Parala. So you can hear that ascending buzzy trill as it goes on up the scale and then just as it's about to go out of what you think is your hearing range, it'll give you this hiccup. And so that is the northern parallel. And they too occur at uh, Ebenezer Swamp. Although to be fair, we did not hear one this past Saturday, but I do know that they occur there. And then one last bird that I want you to to meet tonight only insofar as I've already mentioned a couple of the birds that you can hear at Moss Rock Preserve in Homewood, uh, excuse me, in Hoover, and that is the Prairie Warbler. And it too, if the name implies like open, somewhat brushy areas, maybe some small pines starting to grow back. Um, but this is a bird that has a song very similar to the northern parallel that you just heard, except it doesn't have a hiccup at the end. It starts just barely in the audible range and then it goes right on off the scale. Prairie Warbler. So hopefully I'll close tonight then with this slide an image of the chimney swift going to roost. This is a picture I made oh, a couple years ago, I guess, in September. This is a, in a, a, a feature we don't uh, have this time of the year for the most part, and that's the chimney swifts going to roost. But I will be glad I'll stop the screen share so that we can go back and if you have any questions that you wanna put in the chat and maybe some of you already have, um, I will be happy to stay on as long as you need to, to answer any questions. Um, I have one, one question. Sure. Is there a Shazam for birds? You know that app you can hold up and record music and it'll tell you what song it is? Oh, as a matter of fact, there is, so let me go to my phone here. It's called BirdNet, BirdNet, Bird Net. so it's B-I-R-D-N-E-T. And awesome. so you can, you can go, and, and now I will tell you that with that, what you have to do is hopefully the bird is singing somewhat in an isolated area or an isolated so that its song tends to stand out a little bit. But that is one, it works well, although what it will sometimes do, if it can't make the distinction, it will give you a couple of different options. And you may have to then research a little bit more as to which one it is. So you could then go to say like, you know, the All About Birds website 
and, and try to figure it out that way. But it's called bird net. And, and we actually used it this past Saturday. That's fantastic. Uh, it's called Shoal Creek. We have a question. What is the sound of a cowbird? Okay, so a, a cowbird is a very lively, bubbly, uh, it, it reminds me of a pachinko machine. If you ever had one of those that had all the little balls cascading. So that's the sound that I typically hear with the brown-headed cowbird. It's kind of like a bubbly, cascading kind of noise. It's a lovely sound. Um, it, it, the brown-headed cowbirds, unfortunately, have a bit of a bad reputation because they're brood parasites. And they nest in, they lay their eggs in the nest of other birds. And you really can't fault the brown-headed cowbird for that because this is a species that is from the American West. And out West, they would follow uh, bison herds around the prairie. And so as, if you're following the, the bison herds because you're feeding on the insects that the bison are stirring up, well, then you really can't stay put long enough to raise young. So what they do is they lay their eggs in the nest of other birds and then they move on. So. The fact that we have them here in Alabama is a testament to the fact that we have logged so many of our forests that we've created the open areas that they need uh, to, uh, to survive. So. Um, there's one comment from some strange man, happens to be my husband. Common crows and fish crows look alike but sound different and we have both around here. Okay, so Randy is absolutely right. So they look alike, but they sound, fish crow is a little bit smaller. If you had them side by side, you might tell them apart. But with the fish crow, it has a very nasal sounding ah. -ah. So the way that I like to remember that, and maybe this can be your homework assignment number two, is to go to All About Birds and listen to the fish crow. It's this nasal two-noted ah, 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 ah. And the way that I like to remember that, me and my little mnemonic devices here, is you ask the crow, are you an American crow? Are you an American crow? And if he goes, ah, ah, then he just told you, no, I'm not an American crow, I'm a fish crow. So the two-noted nasal ah, ah, is the fish crow. Oh. Thank you, that helps a whole bunch. <laughs> Hopefully that will help. The caveat is that when the um, American crows, when they have their young, the young can do a bit of a nasally call. Um, and the other thing that maybe this Randy was kind of implying is that the fish crow likes to be near water. Um, and where I'm from originally in Florida, and where my family is down at the coast, down there, the default crow is the fish crow. And uh -huh. so if you, you know, like if you're doing a bird count or if you're, you know, recording the birds and you say you heard or saw an American crow, well, by gosh, they're gonna want some documentation that you had an American crow <laughs> and not a fish crow, okay? But around here, the American crow is probably, I mean, it is the more common of them. Uh, but, you know, they will fly overhead. My friend Ernie Stokely for years, he's not, he doesn't live in Birmingham anymore, but he used to live up on top of Red Mountain. And he would hear fish crows flying to and from their roost. They roosted somewhere, probably near Red Mountain, I think, but they would fly over his house headed to the Coosa River where they would be more commonly found in the daytime. So the fish crow does like being near water, but that doesn't mean that you can't hear them if they're going back and forth. Are you saying they are also coastal, the fish crow? Are they gonna be- Yeah, so they are primarily, they're coastal, even here in Alabama, if the coast, the fish crow would be more of the default crow down there. Wonderful. I thank you so much, and hopefully in the chat, I, I captured most of the websites that were referred to, and um, okay, here's a question. How can we find out about Audubon field trips? Is there an email newsletter we can sign up? Definitely go to alaudubon.org. Is that right? 
Yeah, at and, uh, org. And, and so for now, we the the only uh, field trip offering we've got one more offering that is coming up in June, but I don't believe it's actually listed on the website. You have to be a member uh, mm -hmm. in order to to get the newsletter the digital newsletter that will be sent out that will have the link. But generally our field trips are open to everybody. And we're hoping that with the pandemic, fingers crossed, finally winding down, we will be able to open them up to everybody. But, and you don't have to be a member to come on our field trip <clears throat> as a general. Oh, good. good, and and just what is an individual membership to, Alabama Audubon it's running. Quite reasonable. It's only it's twenty dollars a year. Oh so, gosh. Yeah. It's it's. Oh it's, yeah, that's nothing. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing it's, but... We're we're much more interested in having you as a member than uh, yeah. than having your. You know, we're just trying to get out there and protect the birds, and so that's why we would like to have you as a member if you want to. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to go to the website and sign up for the tag, you don't have to actually purchase the tag you just have to make the commitment to what i don't know why it is but the department of tourism the department of transportation yeah. before they will issue the tag needs 1000 commitments whether people actually follow through on the commitment you know we don't have any control over that but alabama audubon for that first year will pick up the 50 dollars uh, additional cost for that for you so it's a great price you can be you can be a maiden member a a original member it, yeah the, right and i i only have one car i've got five four bikes but only one car so i can only get one tag so well, thank you so much greg and as i said i'm going to miss these uh bird washing and bird song programs so it'll, you know if y'all want more just maybe send a message to hoover library we need more programs like this so <laughs> Um, anyway, I'm so glad everybody enjoyed it, and I guess we'll sign off now. It's I didn't expect it to go so long, but it, it, it was very, very captivating. So All thank right. you so much. Hopefully we didn't lose too many of you. All right. All right. Good night, Good night everyone. Bye-bye.